We are live. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Ann, and I'm a bookseller with Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so much for bearing with us in our slight technical difficulties, our very little late start um, tonight or this afternoon. We are delighted to host Max Berry, the best-selling author of Providence and Lexicon. We are here to celebrate his newest book, however, The 22 Ma Murders of Madison May, which is a fast-paced psychological thriller about a serial killer pursuing the same victim across the multiverse. This book just came out on Tuesday, so happy belated birthday to Madison May and Max Berry. Um, I read it. It is excellent. So if Thank you me. haven't bought it yet, you can do so by clicking that green button below our video that says buy books with signed book plates. Um, also joining us tonight, we have our moderator, David Yoon. David is the author of the YA books, Frankly in Love and Super Fake Love Song, as well as his newest book, an adult sci-fi thriller, Version Zero, which came out earlier this year. Before we go ahead and get started and I hop off the screen so that you can listen to our authors, who you came here for, not me. <laughs> Just really quick, we've got our general chat on the right-hand side, which you all have found delightfully. Um, and last but not least, most importantly, there's the ask a question button at the bottom of our screen. If you click that, you can type in whatever questions you have for Max or David, and they will get to them at the end of the event. So with that, have a nice event, you guys, and I'll see you at the end. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Max, I'm freaking out. I'm having ah. fanboying right now. <laughs> ah, David, look, I'm, I'm so pleased to, to have you here hosting this event. It's a thrill for me, too. I feel like we have a lot in common, which is going to come out during the course yeah, of this I, event. I feel like I feel like that too, and and honestly, before I was published or before anything really, I read Jennifer Government and I read and I read um, the company, and I I never thought that years later I would actually be in an event with you. So I'm kind of I really am like this is like another multiverse where everything went right, you know. <laughs> oh, it's very kind of you to say. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, it's it's um, so nice to finally meet you virtually, and uh, and it was awesome to read your book. Um, which I, I thought was, it's like, it was so much fun to read. It was so fast paced. I think I read it in one sitting. Um, wow. And it, it, there's a question, I'm gonna jump to a question really quick um, that, that talks about how, mentions that it's sort of your least satirical um, book to date. Um, it's a very like, very lean uh, thriller. Mm. And I wanna get to that in a second, but first I wanna encourage every one on here and there's 74 of us which is great um to ask away just load up the the queue with questions because yeah. because i know i don't know about you but i i love questions um yeah me too yeah I, if we leave enough time for the questions um from for the people here as well that'd be terrific yeah yeah so how are, how are you doing how's your yeah life? yeah i'm great I'm, I'm really good yeah um yeah it's uh it's just afternoon here in melbourne australia uh so it's uh, it's actually a lovely bright day today um, I know it's pretty late for people on the East Coast of the US at the moment, um, like after seven on the West Coast. And if there's anyone who's tuning in from Europe or, or Asia, then it's probably uh, the middle of the night. But um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it would be so nice to be there in person for this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm I'm so bummed that I I managed to time the release of, of two books, you know, which which is in rapid fire succession for me, having two books in, in two years. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, I managed to time that right at the real peak of the world shutting down for the pandemic. So, so that sucks. Um, and I know I'm right this there with you. Yeah. 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 That's right. We've been through this together. Um, <laughs> it is disappointing because I know there are some people now. You know, I've been doing this. Um, I've had the great privilege um, and luck to be doing this for um, twenty years now. And there are some people who have been there from the beginning or from very close to the beginning who I've met multiple times um over a couple of decades uh and being able to see those people um you know is, is a real thrill for an author so it's it's a shame i don't get to do that um and also to meet people who maybe have sort of discovered my work in in the last five years or so and um and i you know, it's always such a great uh great thing to be able to connect with people who have found something in your work and responded to it so yeah unfortunately uh we don't have the the real thing but you know this is what the world is doing now so uh i guess yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. and the, i mean there is a silver lining like um i don't know if we 74 people is a great turnout so we just tend to get more people on in in per event um than we would in person but we don't get yeah, that's true. so that's the trade-off it's, it's kind of a bummer but I mean, I know, I know where you're coming from. My my book, Super Fake Love Song, and then Version Zero, they both came out during pandemic. And, yes. Um, 
not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. But um, yeah, yeah. So I what wanna... did you do? like? I know for me, like um, beforehand, it used to be um, like I feel like when I got started um, publishing books, doing something online was really innovative, um, and not many mm -hmm. authors, maybe not many publishers, were really doing anything in that space. Uh, so uh, for me, the real breakthrough was with. I just bumped my camera there. Um, was with Jennifer Government. Yeah, I'm not doing a shimmy. That's that's my uh, <laughs> point on the stand. Um, yeah, I I created nation states. This uh, this online game, and I know a few people in the chat today uh, are here today because they either found me through nation states or they're regular nation states players uh, or moderators uh, even today. And um, that is something where I just had the idea to. I guess, first of all, create something to promote my book, to like put something out there online that people could discover, even if they didn't care about some new author who had some new book about whatever. Mm -hmm. They might be interested in this, you know, fun online political simulation game where you get to make your own country up and, and run it according to your own rules. So <laughs> I thought, yeah, if I could do something like that online, then I'd have a little ad for my book in the sidebar and, you know, it was Nation States by Max Barry, and then it would provide a way to... Um, provide yeah to get people to be aware that i exist uh, and that yeah, my work yeah. and then people who enjoy that sort of thing would be able to to buy it so yeah that was that was what i was doing 20 years ago um and then since then of course it's all been the promotion for a book has be, moved online more and more oh my god uh, i mean you were 20 years ahead of your time because now yeah, like me. doing you stuff know, online was... having having side gigs and whatever like a line of socks or i don't know what um is sort of normal for for authors we've all become uh, want to be influencers and want to be entrepreneurs. Um, but you, I, I, I looked at your game and I was impressed. I was like, this has been around for a while and, and it's still active. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned before that I think we have some things in common because um, if you go to your website, which is davidyoon.com, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So there's like, um, it's got these different sections, you know, there's, there's your writing, um, but there's all these other little projects that you have done. Or, or maybe I shouldn't say little projects, but um, I feel that have that in common where, um, you know, we each seem to like find other things that interest us and go down a rabbit hole into, oh, I'll create this game or I'll, you know, design this uh, as you have this note binding um, product. And that, <laughs> that's that's your thing. And, you know, it's not like you've just spent a weekend on this. This is like some sphere of your life that you poured yourself into as well. Yeah, the um, note binding thing was, was like, I got a patent for it. I started, the, don't ever get a patent. It's not worth it. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's a huge pain in the butt, but yeah, I, th I think you're right. Like we have, you and I both have like different interests that just like, right. I feel like writing is still the core, um, yeah. but there's other stuff. We contain multitudes as the kids say. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's like a natural um, instinct for an artist to sort of find something interesting and pursue it regardless of whether it makes sense to pursue it. So, um, were you, you know, you're programming in, a, in, the, in your previous life. I'm sorry, what? Were you doing programming in your previous life or, or anything? Uh, yeah, I, I got into programming just because I was a 10 year old boy. And one day um, my parents got me a Commodore 64 computer, which is like nice. the gate rug of computers for, for people my age who, you know, discovered this computer where um, you would turn it on and blue screen would come up and the word ready and there'd be a blinking cursor there. And even if you wanted to play games on it, you couldn't just... Um, well, actually, you could put in a cartridge, but no one did that. Instead, you had like tape decks and, and drives and you had to <laughs> type in the command. You had to type yeah. load, space, quotation mark, you know, asterisk, yeah. quotation mark, comma, eight, comma, one. I think it was something like that. And then you would like, like bring... rerun something or I forget. Yeah, 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 you would have to type commands. So to yeah. actually use the thing at all, even if you just wanted to play games, you had to be a little bit of a programmer. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, it's all sort of hidden behind a user interface and, and you tap it or you click and... You don't get that same uh, more direct interface with the computer by default. Yeah, um, but that's, that's I, I, programming has just been a fun thing for me. Um, it's been a good, I think, exercise for that right brain side of of um, of my brain. Where mm -hmm. uh, writing a first novel for me is this sort of chaotic um, process of just diving into an idea with no process and no rules as to you know what I'm trying to do. And then figuring it out um, through a lot of thrashing around and, and crying. And yeah. So, uh, you know, and when it works, it's, yes. it's, it's so satisfying. It's why I write. 
yeah. but it, yeah. it's so unstructured. Um, where, so it's quite nice occasionally to flip into programming mode and be like, well, here is a concrete problem and you can solve it in these obvious ways. And, mm -hmm. and it's very clear if you made it better or not. Um, whereas yeah. with a novel, you can slave away for a year and get to the end and be like, I'm not sure how successful this is. <laughs> Whereas with programming, it you have your parameters, and it either works or it doesn't. And mm. you, know, you have a finished thing that is actually that you can show to people and and then iterate quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas but then the flip side is no one like I, I find with programming. Like it's the programming is very satisfying to like build this nice thing, but then you know it's not really for you. So mm. you you're doing it to to solve a problem for other people, and the other people will complain. You know they don't like this, or you know you have ruined nation states because yeah, it's. it's true. So well, it's, I mean, I speaking it's, of it's books, less creatively satisfying. I mean, speaking of books, I really want to now that I know that you have sort of this programming background, and you know you worked at Hewlett Packard. That was in your previous life. Um, yeah. What made you choose multiverses? I know that multiverses have like a hold on the collective imagination right now. Um, why do you think that is? And what do you that? Have I stumbled into some current trend in multiverses? I, why do you I, I just like when when uh, Spider Man into the multiverse came out, I was like, what is going on? You know, and my, my I have a nine year old daughter. She watches right. a lot of TV. Um, and she there's a lot of multiverse talk in these shows. Um, okay. And I thought it was just uh, Blake Crouch and Dark Matter, but it turns yes. out that it's like this thing that's sort of on our mind collectively. So when your book came out, I was like, this is perfect because it's like so within the zeitgeist. Right. Um, Interesting. And I was just why is that? I had, I was mainly interested in it just because of the possibilities that it offers for what if stories. And I think it, it suits the kind of fiction that I'm interested in, which is science fiction where it's, um, you know, with the exception of Providence, it's not set in the far future. It's not on a spaceship. It, it doesn't have uh, aliens involved. It's the recognizable real world, but there is some fundamental twist to it that um, changes how people behave or it makes them face particular questions or it allows them to do things that you can't do today. But if we could, then it, it opens some really interesting doors and, and allows us to talk about, you know, would we go through them and, and, and who we are as people. Um, so I got into it like that. But as part of the research, I, I was really interested to discover that the multiverse thing um, is, yeah, it's it's a pretty legit theory. I had kind of assumed it was like uh, time travel or you know one of these science fiction plot devices where it's really convenient for a storyteller, but it's not a real thing. Um, and as part of the research, I now am convinced that the multiverse does actually exist. It's more likely that we really do live in a multiverse than that we don't. Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and in your book, you talk. I wanted to ask you about your research um, because you talk about conservation of information, um, okay, which was so compelling to me. That's the idea that you can't just plop into a different multiverse that is molten lava, and just nothing else, yeah, or like a void, because you carry yourself, you carry information with you that needs to be transferred into the other, the, the next multiverse you enter, um, and so there's always, it's always mostly the same with small differences. And is yeah. that a real thing? Well, well, that that is yeah part of the conceit that I invented. So, so multiverses are probably a real thing, but we'll never be able to travel outside our own one to something else. So, so the whole idea of like moving between multiverses is where you start to get into the realm of fiction. Uh, so, yeah, the the funny thing though, so yeah, this is part of like behind the scenes, right? So, if I'm writing a novel about a multiverse, then I've got to figure out the rules that will govern how people can interact with that, with that multiverse. So um, one of the things that, that, would, uh, that I was trying to figure out is, so if the multiverse is real and there are countless numbers of parallel universes, mm -hmm. then just through um, random chance, like the possibility that any one that you enter will be like our current one is essentially zero. Because okay. if you can, you know, it's very hard for, for us as, as human beings to sort of visualize vast numbers. But uh, and we tend to like, you know, assume that everything is, is like it is now in these other universes, but with mm -hmm. minor different. But yeah, probably 98 percent of them would be completely uninhabitable because. That, you know, and it would make for a pretty short book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So as part of like trying to figure out, you know, if if we're going to if the book has rule A's, B and C, then how how does that affect, you know, what things must be true for that to make logical sense? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So the conservation of information idea is that um, when a person wants to move from one multiverse to another, um, and in the book, there, there are people who can do this, but they can't like preview a world and pick out whether it's going to be um, the one they want or not. It's sort of a step into the unknown. But they are able to stack the odds so that they're not about to walk into a, a you know, molten lava <laughs> world. Um, by um, this principle of conservation of information, which means that the things that transfer have to replace something that was already there. Mm -hmm. So you can't accidentally end up in a molten lava world because you were not there beforehand. And if you're carrying a book through, then the book was not there beforehand. So right. it sort of filters out the vast majority of, of death trap worlds that you might otherwise step into. <laughs> I mean, that, I, I love that, that um, like you're saying, it's, it's a different, it's, it's multiverses are a way of exploring what ifs. Um, it's a way of exploring all the different versions of yourself. And I know in the book, people choose which version they're happy with. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, would, does something happen in your life that inspired that story? Something that was yeah. on your mind? Or... Yeah, so, yeah, I've got a couple of things I'd like to say about that. It's a good question. So the what if thing, um, first of all, I think I, I took a long time to figure out this idea. I was sort of interested in it without knowing what part of it I was interested in. And it was years and years of trying the same idea in different ways before I stumbled upon one that suddenly worked. Um, the, the problem I have with a lot of sort of what if alternate universe ideas is that they tend to naturally be backwards looking in that if you were moved into an alternate version of the world um, and you're gonna tell a story about it, then I think you sort of naturally end up in a place where you're talking about someone who had something terrible that went wrong in their life and they're trying to fix it or there's something in their past that, you know, is different now and this, this other one. And I found that, you know, that wasn't the kind of story that I was really drawn to. And I was trying to find something a bit more forward looking. Um, so the idea of a serial killer who moves between um, different versions of the world um, and is obsessed with this one woman became a more forward looking story where, okay, there's a guy who's doing something and he needs to be stopped. Um, but in terms of like the overall idea, I think Part of the appeal for me was as someone who is now 48 and um, I feel like my life is is reasonably set. Like I spent most of my 20s and 30s just terrified that um, this writing job was going to uh, just go up in smoke at any moment. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, that's like the reality of being an author. Oh. That Yeah, no matter how well things are going, you, it feels like you are one bad book away from, you know, having to crawl back to your job at Hewlett Packard. Oh, yes. I know that feeling. <laughs> right. Right. So, so I had that for a long time. Um, but now I'm feeling like, OK, you know, uh, I have a family. I have two girls. They're 10 and 15 years old now. Um, I've been married for 28 years. So I feel like, you know, my life is is sort of on a more solid path now. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think when that started to happen, I also started to think about, well, you know, how could it have gone differently uh, and how much of of what of the life I'm living now is due to was sort of fated to happen and how much could have been very different, like how much um, turned on the decision that I made 15 years ago about something completely random, like going to see a show that provided the inspiration for a book that then sold well, that then allowed me to do this for a job. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side, like it, it's, it's eye opening to think about multiverses as, or, or just the future, you know, cause the future is sort of branching, infinitely branching multiverses and you choose or are just led down a path. Um, do you have any, you know, free will in choosing, exercising will and like choosing which path you want to go to? And will there always be regret? Um, no matter yeah. which path you choose, will you always be thinking, oh, I should have chosen differently or maybe something better is happening in another branch that I'll just never see. Um, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting, I, for me, when I read the book, I started thinking a lot about, um, uh, you know, being present and everything, but it, it's sort of true. It's, you know, thinking about where you are as opposed to where you want to be, where you think you should be, uh, where you just were. Uh, it sort of brought all that up. And that, I thought that was an interesting effect right. of, of, of a thriller, yeah. you know, which is. Yeah, right. Out, yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that it's it's my least satirical book. And that's, that's probably true um, in that it doesn't uh, sort of speak. Well, I mean, it. it it is less directly um, relevant to political themes or, you know, ideas of corporate power and that sort of thing. Um, they, there is always, I feel like, you know, I always want to say something relevant to the world in a book, whether it's about um, alien invasion or whether it's about um, a woman being hunted across different versions of her life. I, I always hope that there is 
there is something real in that book that is worth talking about, you know, regardless of whether it's a page turner or, or whatever. Um, so for Madison May, um, I think a lot of it um, was sort of not inspired by, but I, was, I felt like I felt compelled to talk about issues of um, uh, of, of women in society, the, the issues that women face. And it's sort of something that I had always considered myself to be like a reasonably feminist kind of guy. Like I, I thought I was pretty woke and, and all that. But yeah, and in Madison, I you keep, have two I, very strong characters. You have Madison herself when you have the cop. Um, right, right, yeah, yeah. Characters. Um, but yeah, I've to, I keep discovering that, um, you know, I was not nearly feminist enough before because there was all these other issues that, that women face on a daily basis that um, that I wasn't aware of. And, and becoming a parent to two girls as well sort of, sort of forces your eyes open a bit more as well. So, yeah, I, I, I hope that with, uh, with Madison May, I mean, I've become like kind of a, like not a fun feminist, but more like an angry feminist sort of guy where it's, you know, <laughs> stuff... You, I can't even talk about it in a way that's like, you know, oh, isn't it nice that he's sensitive? Uh, it's more like, you know, it just becomes, um, listen to this this angry rant. But I think about, you know, there's all this like uh, fe feminist training and anti-sexual harassment training. And and um, really, for me, it's just like respect women. You know, it's, it's really, if you respect women at your core, everything else will follow. And I got the strong sense in your book. And I, I was just about to ask you if you have two daughters, because, and you just answered that you do. Right. Um, were you, it sounds like in a way you're sort of writing it for them to, to, to both respect them and then provide just sort of the publishing universe with more feminine role models or feminist role models for. Yeah. For well, I think, you know, part of it is maybe also an apology for like the, the sort of person that I used to be. I mean, not that I, I think I was, you know, I, I think I did relatively well, um, but yeah, you know, there's the main character in this. The the killer is this sort of incel type who has issues. Uh, he doesn't really see women as real people. So, um, like you say, where you know, it sounds simple an idea, you know, respect women. Um, I feel like there's a lot of dudes who think they respect women, you know, a hundred percent, but they have their idea of what that means. Um, and again, I think I was sort of this person, you know, as a younger man, where you sort of grew up with this entitled idea um, about who you are and, and and what you want out of life uh, and you know it's quite a quite some toxic themes that sort of creep in there without realizing it um, and in Madison May there is this guy Clay who you know thinks that he respects women and he thinks he's in love with this woman and genuinely cares for her but it's only on his terms and when she doesn't meet his ideal of what he thinks she should be like, then he becomes um, angry and violent. So, yeah, yeah uh, although it's, you know, that sort of stuff is like fairly deep down in the themes of the book, um, I do hope that it has something relevant to say uh, in that regard. I mean, I think you did. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's all um, packaged within this very tightly choreographed um, thriller plot, which I, I was just sort of, you know, I can't help but study just the inner world. Right, yeah. And I, I have to ask: Are you are you a plotter? Like, do you do you map everything out at first, or are do you, are you a pantser? Like, do you write by the seat of your pants, or is it? Yeah, I, yeah, a hundred percent. Just figure it out as I went along. Um, so my first book, I think I never knew what was going to happen more than about a chapter ahead. Oh, wow. uh, and I still feel like that's a good way. <laughs> well, like, maybe not a smart way in, in terms of like if you want it to be. If you wanted to build a career as an author, I think it makes a lot of sense to take a very professional approach and, and outline and plan um, and probably not write, you know, one book about alien spaceships and the next book about women uh, being murdered across multiple lives and then corporate, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the early stages of a book for me are, are still very much this wild process of, of discovery. Um, I do find that... I, I plot more towards, you know, once I've got sort of the first 20,000 words or so, and I'm sort of confident that it's, um, that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and I only get to that 20,000 words by writing about 80,000 words and throwing, you know, the bad ones out. Um, <laughs> the bad, but, these bad words out. That's what yeah, right the, it can be hard to figure out which are the bad. <laughs> um, yeah, and then once I, once I sort of got to that point, I found with the last couple of books, with this one and with Providence in particular, I did have an idea of, you know, okay, I think the ending should be this. And I did plan it out um, quite a bit more rigorously than, than I have before. So, yeah, I think that's, um, you know, it, it's a better way to do it if you can do it. I feel like the struggle for me as a writer is often just 
believing in the book enough and and being um you know enjoying it enough to just allow it to to come to life itself yeah, yeah. and if i try to plot it too heavily too early i find i'm you know i'm smashing the life out of it so yeah i, I yeah. heard the best metaphor i've ever heard is like it's like taking a, a road trip at night and you yeah. know what cities you're going to hit but all you can see is what's in front of your headlights so it, it's like there is a general skeleton of where you, what, what the thing is going to be but you have enough you leave enough room for spontaneity so that mm -hmm. when it's for me when it's like five in the morning and everyone's asleep am i including my internet editor then i can just sort of <laughs> let myself write stuff without worrying that it's crazy or nonsensical and then later yeah. in the, the light of day look at it and be like huh it's like a different person wrote that like <laughs> i mean yeah. i was half asleep but that's a good thing are, yeah. are you are you a, are you a fast uh, writer? I, sorry are you a fast writer do you write on computer like what what else is Oh yeah, on a computer. My God, yeah, I can't imagine writing <laughs> longhand these days. But uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, it's I, I have again with this is a good example. So I had this idea for this book probably you know six seven years ago, and at that time it was a, a story about this team of people who would um, you could hire them, and if you had lost something very precious, like if you were a very wealthy couple and you'd lost the you know favorite childhood teddy bear of um, of, of one of you, then you would go and hire this team and they would travel into a parallel dimension and steal it from someone who hadn't lost it, from a version of you that hadn't lost Ooh. it and bring it back to you. And so I thought, well, this is a terrific idea. Um, and so I tried to make that work for years uh, and, and rewrote it. And I could never get sort of beyond a good first chapter. Huh. And it was only when I sort of reworked it into this book that suddenly you know, a whole bunch of pieces clicked and, and it worked for me as yeah, as a story. So yeah, I mean, those... the urgency of, of trying to to track down this this deluded guy who's trying to track down his ideal, what he thinks is his ideal partner, um, is very personal and very uh, emotionally charged. And I, I think, I mean, obviously, I think he made the right choice, but but um, yeah, I don't think I I tried to write that other story and it just didn't work. And I there, think there is that... that version of that that society though in yeah. the book. I don't want to talk about because if you haven't read it. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few. It's a bit of crossover there, but yeah. I think um, actually, I find also if I speak to other writers, I think um, people often seem to fall into the trap of, of feeling like an idea that's great in your head should be great on the page, um, and if it doesn't come out that way, then you are failing as a writer. Mm -hmm. And my attitude is that it's the idea that's failing, and it's you know, it's not your fault that you're trying to animate this corpse. It's it's just for whatever reason not going to work. Yeah, so, that's true. I mean, my wife I, likes. My wife is a, she's a writer too, uh, uh -huh. Nicola Yoon, and she likes to say that your first draft is you just telling the story to yourself, um, and once you tell it to yourself, now you got to make it palatable for other people because you talk to yourself in a different way than you talk to other people, um, which yeah. I thought was a good way of putting it too. And it kind of sounds like what you're getting at, which is like just playing, you know, just stretching and squashing stuff around. Um, yeah, I think I, you fun in that first draft and then yeah then once you've done that and you realize yeah oh my god there are so many plot holes in this thing and this doesn't <laughs> and i really figured out what the book was really about at about fifty thousand words so now it's sort of it's, uh, it's yeah does that mean in your head what is do you do you know what the gray egg is made of <laughs> oh okay so the gray the gray egg in this book um no look so when you tell a story you have to decide what the important part of it is uh, and in this one, the important part of the story was the people involved, Felicity uh, in particular, and also Madison May. Uh, and the the technical side of like how how this is happening, how people are able to shift from one life to another, um, is you know then it needs to not just be completely hand waved away. Um, but it's I didn't want to go down that path too far because it becomes a different sort of book. So yes, the point where I say, look, this just happens is the point where they have the gray eggs that is, you know, crucial to being able to shift um, from one one world to another. So so what they're made out of um, is, yes, <laughs> very, very plot intensive material that allows people to travel from, from one life to another. It's so intensive and dense. It's cold. Yes. It's yes. always cold. Yes. <laughs> and yes. it's splintered, it's so it's got fibers in it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's very cool. So, I mean, I, I guess it's safe to say that you're pr pretty happy in your current multiverse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do feel that I got incredibly lucky, especially early in my career, because I was a 23-year-old kid um, writing in my spare time. 
and I, I dreamed of becoming an author. You know, that was sort of the goal. Um, and uh, at the time, I thought, you know, I could do it. But, you know, obviously, it's a really risky thing to do. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a job that shouldn't work out and doesn't work out for a lot of people. Um, so I made the decision when I was about 23, 24 to um, quit my job at Hewlett Packard and move across the country with my wife to live closer to her parents and I would have a go at writing full time. Mm -hmm. So I had had essentially nothing published at that time. Um, and any rational person would have said, you know, Max, you're making a mistake here. Um, and my dad was one of these rational people who you know, looked <laughs> through my employment contract with Hewlett Packard and was like looking at the, the medical benefits uh, and saying, boy, you know, I don't know why you'd want to keep this up, Max. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. Like rationally, what I was doing was walking off the edge of a cliff and expecting to walk on, on thin air for a while mm -hmm. and somehow become a, an author who could make a living out of it, which is you know, difficult to do for most people. And I think probably especially difficult for an Australian who, um, unless you get published outside your home market, um, it's so the, the local market's very small here. So you can be quite a, a well-selling author in Australia, published only in Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And that's just not nearly enough to live on. Yeah, so, I was wondering about that because the US market is so humongous. Um, yes, yes. That it yes, is so I, country, but yeah, yeah, I got published in the US quite, you know, not by accident, but I had just fired letters off to US agents because stamps were cheap. And, uh, and I got picked up by an agent there who then sort of sold my book and started my career. And yeah, I, yeah, that was, that was something that by all rights shouldn't have happened. You know, I, I didn't really, I don't, I don't know about that because your books are awesome. What are you talking about? And uh, well, company, you say that. You dedicate it. Don't you dedicate that, that to Hewlett Packard? Yeah, look, I, I, sorry, what's the question about Hewlett Packard? Didn't, didn't you dedicate company to Hewlett Packard? I did. Yes. Yeah. I got a lot of material from, from HP. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I feel like there are a lot of very good writers out there um, who have not been published and it's not because, you know, they're not good enough writers. It's because yeah. that, you know, for one reason or another in, in this, in this version of the multiverse, you know, things didn't come together, but, but, you know, they, they will hopefully in the future and they, they could have easily if things had been a little different. Yeah. There's a, there's another thread for everyone to ponder. I, mm -hmm. I ponder that sometimes because I didn't get published until I was 45. Um, and I yeah. spent a lot of time working in user experience design. So like, you know, very close to programming and for like advertising and marketing. And I know you talk a lot about marketing. Um, and, uh, and I wonder if I had started earlier and had success earlier, what kind of writer would I be now? And would I be happy with that writer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back to the yeah. multi, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, but I, I you know, I, I didn't regret that much either. Like I feel like people tend to, you know, no matter what we've gone through, we all as people tend to be like, well, you know, that was a really rough patch or that didn't work out, but I learned so much from it and it, it defined me as a, defines me as a person now. So, um, which actually goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where I wanted to write a forward looking story. And I feel like it's, um, it's more true to, to human personality to, to look forward to what we can do next than, than to look back and say, you know, all oh, that, that went wrong you know it's yeah, um that would be an awfully sad story to just someone sort of yeah it's a bit maudlin yeah i'm sure regret you know not so maudlin yeah. yeah a little bit melodramatic but um i also wanted to ask you about i i was just checking out your um i mean your work is really funny too and it's very cinematic um but one thing that stood out to me i i love humor in writing i think most everything is funny and i was just checking out your nation states game and you said that politics are naturally funny <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I did write that a long time ago. I wrote that in, you know, probably 15 years ago when I, yeah. politics, I probably found politics to be a bit funnier back then than, than I do today. Before I mean, the thing, serious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, like this is this is funny because it has sort of this same. Um, so on nation states, right, which is this political simulation game, um, there there have been people who have come along and they'll build their own nations however they want. Uh, and there's always been people who will build nations that are, you know, di dictatorships and they, they oppress their citizens. And some of those started to have like more close parallels to real world right wing authoritarian nations, um, especially those in Europe in, in the World War Two era, than, you know, we we're really comfortable with. Yeah. And so, you know, at the time I was like, you know, well, that's so ridiculous. You know, everyone knows, you know, Nazis are 
yeah, a joke. Past, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, unfortunately, yeah, you know, that sort of stuff hasn't gone away, and it's become, you know, in the last few years especially, it's become sort of a a real a real threat. Um, and that sort of stuff I find a lot less funny and obviously ridiculous than I did at the time. Yeah, um, although I, I and I I'm here, I'm in the states, so I last year was especially especially hard for me. I was just sort of confused and, and in fight or flight constantly. Um, but I did find that if I got off the internet, that it would give me enough perspective to a be able to find certain things funny. Um, because after a certain point, you got to stop crying. And the only thing left to do is laugh. Um, right. And that's sort of the, the point I reached is, is just this whole theater that we're doing. What does it all mean? And what's going to be the conclusion of it? There obviously mm -hmm. is no conclusion. It just keeps rolling on. We try to squeeze the meaning you can out of it. Um, and the meaning is so absurd that right. for me, in the end, yeah. you just kind of have to laugh a little bit. I don't know. Uh, there is a gigantic truck going past my house at the moment, for which I apologize. But no worries. Um, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I would love to get back to that idea that, you know, this sort of stuff was absurd and we do all have more in common than, than keeps us apart and all that. But mm -hmm. yeah, it has it has been a an alarming time, the last sort of four years in particular and the rise of... Um, of sort of alt-right um, thinking. Uh, and yeah, I think we get to see now sort of what goes around on social media and what used to be maybe there's small groups of people having private discussions about is now spreading across Facebook um, uh, in, in meme form and, and just zombie ideas that, that persist yeah. um, no matter you know, what the facts may say. So yeah, yeah and it's, uh, it is a shame that that we've become so splintered um, and that we don't seem to be able to agree on, on what reality is anymore. Um, I don't know. Like, so, yeah. How are you, what what do you, what have you been um, consuming media wise to sort of cope and just like be your companion, your, your um, comfort during this time? Um, yeah, well, look for, for me, I mean, it's not really consuming. It's more about expressing. So I did, Feel the need to like go back and write a political satire um <laughs> which i think probably a lot of <laughs> us found some way to express it um which is called discordia and that'll be published as an as an um audible original book a little bit later so okay so, yeah there was that which is sort of this was i actually wrote that um quite a few years ago now sort of 2016 2017 um in response to the idea that like i've always been really interested in persuasion like how people are persuaded and how ideas can spread virus like you know that sort of thing and I found it really amazing how that was really taking over in um, 2016, 2017. And that oh my God. we, yeah. you know, just crazy ideas that were spreading around um, and didn't seem to be able to be stopped. And we couldn't agree on even basic fundamentals anymore. Still um, can. And, yeah, and this uh, sort of barrage of them too, it was like there'd be, there'd be one crazy idea and before you could adequately discuss that and sort of figure it out, there'd be the next idea and the next and the next. So mm -hmm. it was, it was almost like a coordinated assault of, of misinformation that was just, you know, overwhelming people until you just shut down and you said, look, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. I don't want to think about it. I just want to be able to live my life. Um, yeah. So I thought that was a, that was like an interesting, an interesting situation. Uh, and yeah, I, I wrote a, a political comedy about it. Um, which uh yeah uh was oh, you know, man, i can't can't wait to see it and did you come to any conclusions or do we have to read the book to find out uh look i don't know if i i try to come to conclusions in writing it's you know there's an interesting situation i think if you go in as an artist and you you illustrate it um then you've done your job uh obviously you know i have my own opinions about about this stuff and you know they're probably pretty clear to, to people who read things like jennifer government um but yeah, my, my job, you know, I'm not trying to write a persuasive text so much as I'm trying to blow up an existing situation and allow it to be shown for what it is. I, you know, I'm, I'm the exact same way. I, I wrote Inversion Zero, which is my thriller about the internet. It's about this group of hackers that take on the big yeah. five companies for their sins against humanity. And like, yes, I, which I think my stuff would really enjoy as well. I can, I can yeah. definitely recommend version zero yeah i saw it like there's a little bit of code at the start of the chapters and i was like you, know, you, you had me right from that a little oh, bit of java I think something stuff. about that code um on my social in a little bit like probably right. next week there's a secret behind it but um yeah sure. since writing this book like in every interview i give the question inevitably comes up which is like so dave um what's your advice on staying safe on the internet 
And I was like, I didn't write this book to be like a polemic on you know, how, how to live on the internet. It's like exactly what you're saying. It's take a situation and just sort of explode its parts so that we can be, can, we can be aware of how it works and what it's made of. And then that awareness hopefully leads to wisdom. Um, but it's a lot to ask. I don't know. It's um, asking about the political situation and disinformation and fake news and the mm -hmm. breakdown of trust is, is a tough one. And we're so still in the middle of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to read your book. I hope it like enlightened. I know it's going to be enlightening because you're you. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. But um, are you reading anything right now? Uh, yes, yes. I actually just read. Um, I read a book. It's a very short book, but um, you know, you mentioned um, company and and my experience at Hewlett Packard, and there's a book called. Several people are typing by uh, Kelvin Kasuki, I oh, believe. That's a good title. Uh, that's a great title. Yeah, it's um, yeah. It's, so the whole book is basically a Slack conversation of people at work, um, and it's a little bit surreal. Um, and it's it's yeah, very short, very hilarious. Um, but yeah, I, I recommend people check that out. Several people are typing. That's fantastic. Yeah. And um, you're so you're going to do Discordia? Is that is that what's called Discordia? And then Discordia. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Anything else coming up next for you? Uh, no, look, that'll do me. That'll be three things in two years, which is a break pace for me. So, yeah. That's pretty yeah. brisk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was working on a few yeah. things at once. Um, that's why it's been such a gap between um, Lexicon and Providence. I had a few different things I was going back and forth on. So um, at last, they all got finished at one time. So, yeah, that was good. That's fantastic. I mean, um, I just want to be aware of the time. We, and yeah, there's, we there's like a bunch of questions. So let's get to the questions. What do you say? Yeah, sounds great. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm just going to start. Uh, Evan's got a question about. Um, oh, Evan went away. Oh, about John Nike. John Nike. Uh -huh. Who in your life inspired John Nike? Nike. Aspiring villains want to know. Yeah. So John Nike. Um, there's two John Nikes, but the one I know the one he's talking about um, in Jennifer Government is the the corporate villain. And so I this is you know drawn from my experience at HP. Not that we had a John Nike working there, but you know I went into that corporate environment of a, a quite a high powered sales team um, as a young kid. And I discovered that there were these people there who were, for the most part, um, middle aged men who were on high salaries and who were paid according to um, whether they beat quota or, you know, what bonuses they got. So um, it was a really ruthless sort of cutthroat group of people who um, were you know very focused on the end goal uh and who cared about things that were very different to sort of what i cared about coming out of university is you know a, a young guy with um a social conscience so uh it was yeah it was my exposure to, to that group of people and how they didn't really care a whole lot about what people like me thought they you know they wanted to make sure that they had you know more money than the other guy and and were sort of ahead on status in that regard so it was yeah, there's probably a fair bit of John Nike that sort of came from the, the type of corporate characters I met um, while working at HP. And there, there you are, the idealistic, you know, young guy. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Sharks. Oh, geez. Yeah, I was like that too. I worked in tech and I, I actually believe that tech could make the world a better place, like they say. Mm. And then when I we started getting into user analytics and user tracking, I was like, what? What are we doing? <laughs> like, I worked at yeah. an ad tech company where everyone who worked there had ad blockers installed. Right. We were literally the non-smoker who was working at Philip Morris. And, and I, right. that, yes. I had to just stop and think about my life. But um, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, uh, Reployed Productions. Rippy, yeah, Rippy. Yep. Rippy, Rippy. Um, uh, have you ever thought about writing either a prequel or a sequel to any of your books? The aftermath of events in things like Machine Man or Lexicon seem like they could be fun areas to explore. Yeah, I, I mean, that would make sense from a commercial point of view, or at least not going off into a totally different sphere every time I publish a book. Like, I've got to the point now of every single book, I'm just waiting for it, and someone will say, well, this is very different to his previous stuff, every single time. Um, so the thing is, I feel like what brings me to the keyboard is the the ability to discover something new and to throw around ideas and to suddenly find something that's interesting and, and feel like, oh, you know, I... I want to go deeper down this hole. Mm -hmm. And so I've never felt compelled or drawn to, to the sequel or the prequel idea just because it doesn't seem to offer that same spark. 
now you know not to say i'd never do it um because you know it, it may work but yeah i i just find so I, I always want the next challenge so you know if i've if i've written a book like um jennifer government or lexicon then yeah i guess first of all by the time you get to the end of a draft you, you've just you've lived it for so long and you've reworked yeah. it so much you <laughs> just wanted to go away and leave you alone for a while so there's probably a bit of that as well Oh yeah, uh, I, have fr- I have friends who write like books, fantasy series that are five, six, seven books long, and I don't know how they do it. I, I prefer- yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I understand like on an intellectual level how it'd be quite nice to be like I've, I've figured out all the rules of the world now. I know the characters. I've got everything in place. Let's just do this. Um, but but for me, it, it just doesn't work that way. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of the same way. And also, you know, when you do a prequel or a sequel, you have to take the thing that people know and love, and and tear it apart. Um, because if you just kept it the same, then it would not mm. be that thing. So in, to introduce more conflict, you have to break the thing that people love. Yeah. And I want to tell people like kind of that's a... what's involved. Are you sure you want this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I could kind of see myself doing that where it was the type of sequel that ruined the original because it, you know, it, it just destroyed something that people actually liked in the first one. Yeah. But you know, um, that I would find more interesting to write. Yeah, totally. Um, someone, let's see, uh, Someone's asking about, um, oh, uh, Jessica Poe is asking, can we, should we look forward to anything getting optioned anytime soon? And also, how do you feel about Syrup from 2013? Right, yes, okay. So, um, yeah, the great news was that the 22 Murders of Madison May um, has been picked up for TV um, just recently. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Um, so the way this works, of course, is, a lot of stuff gets optioned and not a whole lot of stuff gets made. So it's, it's, you know, step one on the road. Um, but there's some really good people involved. Um, the showrunners are from the flight attendant, which is a really great show. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's exciting. And there are people in the industry who have sort of been aware of my work for a while and, and um, who, you know, will look out for my stuff now. So it's, you know, I feel really privileged that I was able to get, my work in front of them and, and then they've, they've picked it up and will hopefully uh, make a terrific series out of it. So um, uh, that, you know, that's where that is at the moment. Um, so congratulations. Oh yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a thrill. So it's funny because, you know, when I got started stuff was always option for movies, but in the ensuing couple of decades now, it's all about streaming services. So it's, uh, it's mostly about TV these days. Um, like the books, I don't feel have changed a whole lot, but, but the market has moved, so it's it's no longer a movie. It's now it's it's got to be a series. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So Syrup was the one of mine that was made into a movie, um, and yeah, that was that was a phenomenal experience because <laughs> I got to actually go out um, on set. So it was like a small movie. It was like an independent movie. The the budget was only a few few million bucks. So where was um, the shoot? Greg? Sorry, where was the shoot? It was in New York. Um, right. So I got to, um, yeah, but. You know, and it was it was so such a surreal experience to be on set with these characters who I'd imagined while writing yeah. in my spare time as as a sales rep for Hewlett Packard, no. and yeah, it felt like you know the whole place had been dreamed up, you know, and and all these people dressed up as as people I'd imagined were were you know, from you know, a dream. Um, so that was that was really exciting. Um, the movie itself, so you know. I found I, I have no ability to objectively assess um, my own work, my own writing. Um, and yeah, I just sort of watched this whole movie in like a sweat, like not knowing what to make of it the whole time. Oh, um, so yeah, but it was, you know, it's, it's amazing. The people did such a good job. There were so many smart people who came together. And um, I had also like a short cameo in this movie as well. And Oh, I, I was and, just going to ask. Like, I yeah, yeah. The, you, the cameo. So what did you do? Like, how did you... Okay, so originally they were like, you know, what what part do you want? And um, and I was like, oh, this part here where the waiter would be good. And the waiter had like um, two lines. And then as the, the day was approaching and I'd been spending a few days hanging around the set, um, I became aware that there were probably 100, 200 people there who like all knew exactly what they were doing and it was their job. And I was like <laughs> blundering into the middle pretending to act when I had never done it before. Oh my and God. I was like, I, sh- I shouldn't be doing this. So um, I, I convinced them to like cut my lines because I lost the b- faith in my own ability to deliver them um, with you know, <laughs> any sort of comp. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and they were like, wait, you want your lines removed? And the other actor 
going to get more lines. Um, and you're like, I'm a writer. I'm not like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's for the good. It's for the good of the picture. Um, I call that very noble. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, and I did. I did the little cameo, and and that that was nice. So, yeah, I have yeah the DVD um, on my shelf here, and yeah, I'm very proud oh, of it. That's fantastic. I got. I mean, Nikki's two first two books. My wife uh, were made into movies, and and we had cameos in those. Um, but um, not not anything like a a waiter uh, role, like with a close up shot. That's fantastic. Um, right. I still aspire to my favorite author cameo in the world is in The Handmaid's Tale, the TV series, when yeah. um, it's a torture scene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and someone is going to just whack the crap out of this poor woman. And they pull focus onto the, the attacker, and it's Margaret Atwood. Yes. And she just decks her. And I was like, that is an author cameo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one That's day. A, one yeah. day I'll get I'm such a fan of Margaret Atwood as well. So that was, yeah, that was amazing. Oh, yeah, I idolized her. Um, okay, so question, sorry. Uh, Greg Rubin is asking an interesting question about um, inspired by both Providence and nation states. What are your thoughts on how computer slash AR games are shaping society and human interactions? Well, that's a very deep question, Greg. Yeah. That's time yeah. we have. <laughs> that's five minutes. <laughs> Well, I was thinking, you know, this is sort of only a tangent answer, but I was thinking that there's a, the opening line in Machine Man is, uh, I woke and reached for my phone and it was not there. So it's the guy who he wakes up and, he, and his phone is missing. Um, and I remember writing that line at the time and I, I thought it was a good line because it suggested there was, you know, the mindset of a person who, as soon as they woke up, the first thing they thought about was, where's my phone? Now, when I wrote this, this was, you know, not a normal thought to have. But today, I am a guy who wakes up and immediately reaches for my phone. Um, you know, it's, yes. it's just, it, it's ingrained. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I do think it's had in a, a huge impact. Um, the way that we have these devices now um, and we can scroll through stuff is amazing. So I was speaking um, with another author a couple of days ago, Jeffrey Diva, who talked about, he sees that um, his competition is streaming services and he's thinking about you know the sort of uh, expectations that tv shows today um place on their audiences and how those audiences will sort of expect something similar from novels as well mm -hmm. um which i think is true um but there's also this kind of uh way that we've been taught to read now by skim 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 as you're flicking through your phone uh yeah. which yeah, it's frenetic. Uh, and I would find even as a reader myself, um, I do find that I, I think I've lost patience with books, partly because of the way that the phones will deliver that dopamine hit of next story, next idea so quickly. Um, so yeah, yeah there's, um, yeah, that, that I think has been quite corrosive to reading in general. And I actually have to like make the effort now if I'm going to um, enjoy a good book to not have the phone nearby because, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise it's like calling to me the whole time. Yeah, and then I keep hearing things about like, you know, delivering short like stories, serialized stories via Substack, and like maybe and there's another I forget the platform name. It's almost like you're reading a string of texts, and that yeah. is the story, which I find personally horrifying. But I will right. say, coming from the the young adult world, um, teenagers read, and when they read, they prefer the paper book because yep. they live on screens so much that mm. they just want to just get away from it, and books are their escape. Um, from that yeah like i was at a resort in hawaii like a disney resort and there's this teenage girl and she's reading a giant hard hardcover book and my wife and i just had that it was, it was actually our friend's book who's also a writer and we had to ask her like why do you read the paper book and she's like it's just nicer it's just a yeah. nice experience it's relaxing and mm. so that that kind of thing and like teens are like big purchasers of physical books so that mm. kind of gives me hope that there is yeah. a limit that you reach and then you can't go past it because it's too much. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I do agree. Like there's there's nothing that I find more satisfying than a really good novel. Like of all all the various forms of entertainment that are out there. Um, yeah. when you find a novel that um grabs you so much that you know you're always thinking about when can I get back to that book? Um yeah, it's it I feel like we can connect to it on a level that isn't matched by by anything else. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I do find sometimes, you know, I'll go for weeks without picking up a book just because, you know, I started this book and it's a bit slow at the start and the phone is right there. Um, so there is that sort of competition. Yeah. That didn't there exist. Competition. And there's a, there's a really sad fact of life, which is like, um, boys in particular, when they go up until basically high school, they read voraciously. 
Mm. And then when they hit high school, suddenly there's sports and video games and, and TV and the internet, and they stop reading altogether. Um, yeah. The number of boys, teenage boys who read is, is very low. Uh, and I'm always, I'm always wondering about the future of the printed page. Like, how do we compete when there's so many other things vying for people's attention? Yeah. I don't yeah. know, but interesting. Um, yeah. Speaking of books, um, yeah. Sean has a great question about book covers. You always seem to care a lot about the covers of your books. Fans voting for Machine Man, international editions of Jennifer Government, etc. Which of your book covers is your favorite? That's an impossible question, maybe. Uh, is your apparent interest in book covers due to your background in marketing? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I I am interested in book covers. I think I'm interested in anyone who like takes my work and then produces some um, derivative of it, some some version of it, whether it's a book cover or whether it's you know they drew a character that that was in the book and sent it to me. And I just or they made a movie of it. In, in the case of Syrup, it's just amazing to me that I can put an idea out there and then it will come back in some sort of sister form of, of something else. Um, I've been really lucky with the covers um, of my books. Um, so this one like you know, is, um, is a terrific, terrific design. Um, That's a great design. It's yeah. a really good one. Jennifer Government and Lexicon both had um, really strong covers. Um, there's one on the, on the wall behind me if I rotate this a little bit. I was bit. gonna ask you about that, the double X. Your... Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, put on hand. I was asked about this recently. So this was my first ever novel. Um, so there's a couple of things here. There's the double X and there's the guy poking over the top. Um, this was I was not happy with this cover when it first came out because the main character um, in this book is never described physically, and it was quite important to me that 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 person not be described. So you would just imagine what he looked like. You wouldn't you know be told whether he was handsome or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so then when the publisher came out with the cover design, they did the thing that um, that I've discovered every publisher does, where they say, you know, uh, we've got this great cover design. Uh, everyone here loves it. I hope you do too. And then they show it to you to see whether you're going to say that you like it too or, or you're going to ruin everybody's day. <laughs> uh, so in this case, I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't really like the guy poking over, his, his head poking over the top. Um, and the, as it turned out, that, um, that guy... Um, is is Ivan Held, who was the marketing director at the time for my publisher, um, and is now like the head of Putnam and like the most powerful man in the publishing universe, just about. Um, and he's been he's very good to me. Uh, so yeah, but we did have a, a minor squabble about whether his his head should have been on this book, um, and it did wind up there. So I didn't win that battle, um, but it's uh, yeah. So that was that was sort of when I discovered that I have a lot of control over everything between the the covers but but not on the cover itself yeah and and does that how does that feel i mean coming from marketing like how you you know how people talk about these these sorts of things i come from a marketing background too so i can i can almost hear the meetings they're having behind the the cover designs and i'm just wondering yeah. like do you ever want to be part of that oh uh, i don't I mean, know how do you feel yeah i mean i think the people who have been doing those covers and have been sort of promoting my stuff in general have been brilliant at it. So, um, you know, I'm very happy to leave them to do their thing. Um, you know, it's, it's such a different skill set writing compared to promoting. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoy the writing part of it and the, the, the promoting part of it. You know, there's parts that are amazing where like I get to go out and meet the other humans who have connected with my work. Um, but the decisions about, how to promote a book are, are kind of excruciating and you know it's also personally terrifying where it's like your livelihood on the line and if if it doesn't go well then maybe you know you won't get to be a full-time author anymore so um i i couldn't say i'd want to do more of that um but yeah i certainly have a lot of opinions about stuff so i'm always happy to, to share them with with publishers whether they want them or not um and we're kind of almost done but like this is a fun question i don't know who it is but Oh, Dakota, of all your books, which book's opening line is your favorite? Another which impossible. opening line? Gee, um, I'd have to think about what the opening lines were. Uh, Jennifer Government's pretty good. It's like very plotty. I think as Hack first heard about Jennifer Government at the water cooler, that's not bad. Yeah. Um, Syrup is uh, I Want to Be Famous, which is like a pretty <laughs> snappy introduction into like who that character is. Uh, I don't think Madison May has a particular line in, in particular that, that grabs you, but 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, those those I'm, are probably. I'm, I'm impressed that you remember those just off the top of your head. I don't remember my first lines. Oh <laughs> right, okay. And nobody has a good one too because it's something like Monday morning, and there's one fewer donut than there should be. That's a good one. <laughs> I will say that even if the the book itself doesn't have the most memorable first line for you, the jacket copy has an incredible first line for Madison May. And it's just the, um, I love you in every world. And then if you read the next paragraph, you're like, what's going on? Yeah, um, right. But yeah, um, thank you so much for joining us. I have one more question for you, Max, just because I'm selfish and it was my question. <laughs> and it's just, um, what is your cat's name? Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Because yeah, I've noticed she's been prowling around. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that is well. The, the girls named her Tibbles, um, which you know Tibbles. didn't really work for me so much. So I, I've called her Tiberius. But um, yeah, <laughs> she's been meowing a bit, which I hope didn't come across on the audio too much. Um, oh so. no, couldn't didn't yeah. pick up on there. So she was fine. She did yeah. try her hardest to steal the Mighty show. Mighty Tiberius, <laughs> rolling around on the carpet. Color. Of course. All right. Well, well thank Max, you guys just, so much can I just for joining us. A little bit, like your book is awesome. It's so nice to finally meet you, and hopefully our paths will cross in the real world and in the future. Um, but yeah, everyone thank go you. buy his book. It's fantastic. Yes. You thank you so much. Yeah, really thank appreciate you. doing. It. David's work is amazing too. He has the same sort of, you know, he, um, frankly, in love. I think has just got this this character in it that I think if you enjoy the sort of. Um, open, immediately accessible kind of writing, you know, where you get to meet someone's brain right from page one. I think that's a, that's an amazing story to read. Um, and version zero is also sort of very similar to sort of the same concerns that, you know, big corporate power and technology and how it affects us and where we're going. So I think those are a couple for, for people to look into. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And with that, have a great night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.